Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are gonna be continuing to work on the 1970 bug build. And as promised in the last video, today we're gonna to be building the beam. And like I said, we're gonna be building this beam to class 11 specifications. I already went ahead and pulled the beam out of the car and got it all disassembled. And here's what we're currently working with. So I took the wire wheel and just got all the dirt and grease off of everything. That way we have a nice clean surface that we can actually weld to. So this beam's all ready to get worked on. And I just wanna go through some parts that we have here real quick before we start working on it. I got this whole setup from the Sletten Brothers. So I got these ball joints. These are MP ball joints that are actually made if you're gonna be lowering a car. And the theory behind running these is they have a little bit more angle in them to accommodate lowering your vehicle. So higher angle, that's good for lifting your vehicle as well. And one cool fact is that the limiting factor on the suspension for droop is the ball joint binding. So by having some higher angle ball joints, you're gonna be able to droop that suspension out a little bit more, so that's always helpful. They also supplied me with these outside beam gussets, which will just sit somewhere like here. We'll have one on each side. And to go with that, we have the hook and rod setup. So this rod will have one on each side. It'll go through the outer and poke onto this side and we'll weld that all in. And then we have these hooks, which will latch on to our arms, those will get welded on there, and it'll come down and it'll hit on the rod. And that's basically our bump stop and our limit strap, it's just hook and rod. So that's what's limiting the suspension on the beam. I do wanna just give a big shout out to Riley Walker, as well as the Sletten Brothers. These dudes have spent a bunch of time with me over the phone, just setting me up with information and telling me how to set up this beam. So thank you guys, I appreciate that. And we also got some other parts from Cartech. So I got brake lines, these are a little bit shorter than the ones I put on the 64 bug. These are 22 inches, whereas the ones that I put on the 64, I believe are 24. So we're gonna be running those. And we also have all the fittings that we need for the brake system to adapt to these AN style brake lines. We also got some other miscellaneous stuff in here, just some shifting bushings, as well as some bushings for the beam itself. So a big thank you to Tyler Cartech for that stuff. And now, boy, dude, it's dude, freaking boy. That is your boy. And we also have probably the coolest thing that's gonna be going on here. Uh, these took a while to get just because everything's been shut down and slow due to COVID. But we got the King Class 11. Got King, bro. Yeah, got the King Class 11 shocks. So these are pretty cool. Uh, seems like everyone's starting to convert to these. Some of the reasons being that here, can you just hold this real quick? Some of the reasons being that you just have a bigger hose as well as a larger shaft, which is gonna be stronger. Christian loves larger shafts. It's freaking so ropey, had, dude. I just had to go with the Kings because Christian loves the bigger shafts on them. So we're gonna be running these. I'm super pumped to put these on the car, but enough with that, we'll get into actually setting this beam up. I did go ahead off camera as well, and I drew some lines and put some tape on here, and I'll explain what that's for. The reason we put this Sharpie line in there is to measure how much we're actually gonna be rotating the center section. And on this beam, we're gonna be setting up with 9 16 rotation. On the other bug, I did a quarter inch and that was fine for that. But a lot of the class 11 dudes like to do either a half inch or 9 16 So we're gonna be bumping it up on this. Tim Sletton did warn me that because I'm not running a cage, it might be a little stiff, but that's fine. If I ever decide to build this into a full class 11 build or the next owner does, then this beam will already be set up correctly. And then I've also set this tape up with a gap of two and a quarter. And the reason we have tape on here is just to provide a clean cutting line all the way around. So if you get the ends to line up like this, you know you have a straight cut that you're gonna be doing. And so I'm gonna bust out the angle grinder and get this cut. All right, look at that, dude. Look at that. <laughs> That like what, is disgusting. Like what happens after you have some hot Mexican food right there. Oh. <laughs> now that we got this center section cut out, I took some degreaser and some paper towels and cleaned all the grease and everything out of there. So when this is getting welded, all the heat won't melt that grease and it won't get into the weld. So we'll have a nice clean surface. And now you can see where these lines are useful. I took just a roller and lined things up and kind of bent it around. And this is 9 16 um, of an inch, that's how much it's rotated. One thing to note is that this can go in either this way or 180, make sure you're putting it back in the right way. 
and we're just using magnets to hold everything in place and try and get the center section as centered as possible. That way you're, you don't have a huge gap on one side and a small gap on the other. So right now Christian's getting ready to tack everything together. And after that, we're gonna take a stone disc and create a beveled edge in here. That way the weld has a place to sit down in there. That way it's not stacking up and getting all weird. You'll get nice penetration and it'll sit flat the on the all tube. All the penetration. Yeah, so he's gonna get that going and then to finally weld this thing all together. So Christian and I have been cranking on this beam. We got the top all in as well. No point of filming that since it's just the same as the bottom. So both of these are set to that 9 16th measurement. And once we finish that up, we started prepping the rest of the beam to weld all the seams because part of class 11 rules is that you can weld all of the stock seams on the beam. So we're gonna do that, just strengthen things up. The joints that we're gonna be welding are the ones that hold the whole mount for the beam on. So we'll go here, 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 here. And then on the top up here as well, since that's not welded at all. And then we're going to leave the bottom how it is with a little gap, just in case anything gets down in there, it can still fall out. And then this whole seam right here, we ground down flat so that everything's sitting level with each other. And Christian's going to go ahead and TIG weld that together. And then the last thing that we're going to weld on here is going to be this right here. So on all these joints, there is spots where it's not welded 360. So we're just gonna fill that in, make sure everything's welded completely. That's where we're currently at. And it's just gonna be some more welding. All the welds. Yes, sir. All right, let's get after it. So he's been working away. Christian got this stuff welded up all nicely, looking really good. And we tried welding this seam right here and it just ended up not looking very good because of dirt and just stuff down in there. So we ended up just grinding it flat. And we're gonna leave it like this. If I decide to race this car, we may come back and weld the seam just for extra precautions. But for now, we'll leave it like that. We took the stuff from the Sletten Brothers kit, uh, the outer, overlays and Christian just tacked those on there and now he's going to go ahead and final weld them on and then after that we can start working on stuff for the hook and rod setup. Christian and I spent some time off camera just getting one side all dialed in before we were going to show you guys the other side. One of the things that we did do off camera was get the ball joints installed on all the arms. So like I was saying in the start of the video, these are the MP high clearance ball joints, which are just gonna allow the suspension to cycle a little bit more. So you definitely wanna get these installed before you start doing any hook and rod stops because this is what's limiting your travel at full droop. So get these installed. We used our Harbor Freight 20 ton hydraulic press and then I went over to O'Reilly's and got just their ball joint kit. The sleeves that come in that kit are really useful for sliding around and getting everything done. And on this arm specifically, when you're pressing it in, you can notice you press it in this way and you technically have to push the boot through here. What we did is pulled this boot and the little clip off, that way it didn't get damaged and that worked out well for us. And so once you get the ball joints done, then you can start doing the rods or putting those in. So this is what the setup's gonna look like once you're all done. We have the rod in the center here, the two flat plates on each side of that. And then on the arms, you have the hooks. One thing I like about the 11 Brothers kit is they have these big flat surfaces that are hitting against each other. On a typical hook and rod setup, this hook would just be contacting the rod. And that just leads to a lower contact patch, which leads to larger stress concentrations. So your parts just aren't gonna last as long. So I'm super pumped that they did that in this kit. 
We'll show you guys where we're at on the other side. Christian already went ahead and drilled a pilot hole for our hole saw. And the way we go about doing this is we take a center line between these two points, and that's what this first line is, then go a quarter inch below that, and then that's gonna be our line where the pilot hole gets drilled. And the way we figure out this point right here is we take the one inch hole saw and line it up just on the edge of this plate and then mark center. And that's what Christian's done and he's went ahead and drilled this hole already. So now we just need to take the hole saw and go all the way through. That the way the rod can sit in there all the way. So from that montage, you guys saw Christian and I assemble this side all the way. And now I wanna backtrack a little bit and explain what we've done. So like we were saying, we got that rod in there. Christian TIG welded it all together. And then I went ahead with our little grinder and ground out some of the welds. That way, when we put the plates up against here, they're sitting completely flat. So here's the plates that are gonna sit on there. I also put a bevel in here just to clear any little bit of weld that's left. So when this sits on here, it will sit all the way down flat and not kind of at an angle due to the weld on there. And then we went ahead and put the original pivot bushings back in there just to get everything set back up. Put the arms in, got our eccentric camber adjuster in there. This is an aftermarket one that MP makes that is also meant for lowered or lifted vehicles. So that'll match these ball joints. That way you can get more adjustment out of those adjusters. And then we put the spindle and everything back on there and then put our king shock in there. One thing you have to do to be able to compress the shock like this is just go to the end, take all the nitrogen out of there. Only take the nitrogen out of these shocks when you're doing stuff like this and just cycling it. Never drive the vehicle with the nitrogen out. And why is that, really? Mr. Christian? Because you're gonna screw things up. <laughs> well, what are you gonna mess up? Go through it. So the reason you don't wanna do that is because there's an IFP inside of the reservoir that separates the nitrogen from the oil. And if you don't run it with nitrogen inside of there, it's gonna move that IFP because it needs to be set at a certain depth. So if you run it without it and you start cycling the shock a whole bunch of times while it's on the vehicle and you're driving, it's just gonna screw that up and then the shock isn't gonna work properly. Well, the nitrogen's keeping pressure against the oil too, so aren't you yeah. gonna get a bunch of air in there? You possibly could, yeah. Like if, air bubbles? Yep, if it starts seeping the air um, on the other side of the seal of the IP, you're gonna cavitate the shock and it's just not gonna be good. So it's just all around, you wanna have nitrogen in your shock. Yeah, and the shock's meant to have nitrogen in it and it's gonna perform how it should be with it in there. So yeah. once you're done cycling stuff like this, always make sure you fill it back up. And, and don't fill it with air. Whatever you do, do not put air in it. Put nitrogen in the shocks. And what, like what should these get? Uh, these will just get 150 PSI. Okay. So we got that all in there. Now we can cycle this whole system freely and go on and mount these as well as the hooks so that we have essentially our bump stop and our limit strap for the suspension setup. So it's kind of hard to do this because uh, it takes two people to get these put in here, but basically what we did is to get this side set up, we had the shock at full compression, and then we just set our little stop on here and then have it touching when it's at full bump, and that is where this gets set. And what we like to do is get this portion right here set up so it's nice and flush, so you could just put a weld through here and then it's just done. Um, figuring out where this plate needs to be as far as the location up and down, it's kind of just like a kind of a guesswork and you gotta do it a couple times just to figure out where this plate comes down and meets this plate when it's at full droop properly. But to get the other side, it's the same deal. This is at full droop right now and we sucked it up about an eighth of an inch on the shaft so that way we're not using the entire stroke of the shaft. You can see everything right there lines up nice and perfectly. So. Now we can go ahead and get these prepped, get this surface right here prepped, and we can set this up in here and get it tacked into place so it's touching. And then on the bump side, because we do have a rubber bump stop on here, what we're gonna do is set a piece of plate in between this stop right here and the little arm. 
That way the bump stop can compress a little bit and we can still use the bump stop to its full potential and it'll squish that bump stop before this actually hits. Christian just wrapped up getting this stuff all tacked together and you can see what he was saying about having a little bit of a gap in here. We just took an eighth inch piece of plate and stuffed it on the end. You don't want it going through this whole thing just on the end piece. And then he tacked this hook onto the arm. The reason we do that is for this little bump stop right here, just to allow it to compress a little bit. And it's not gonna translate perfectly. So an eighth inch here doesn't mean an eighth inch here, but it should be pretty close with the angle of the shock on the arm. So we're happy with that. And like he also said and touched on before, when we go to full droop, we just back it up an eighth of an inch. That way we're hitting on metal before fully maximizing the output of the shock. Yeah, so when it, it fully extends, you want this to contact metal to metal, but on the bump side of it, I'd rather have this bump stop on the shaft hit first because that's gonna be a little bit softer. It's gonna hit. be a softer hit compared to that metal stop hitting because that would be a very harsh feeling. So you want this rubber bump stop to collapse a little bit first and then your hook and rod would be your very last ditch effort before the shock com completely bottoms out. Yeah, on any setup, you don't want the shock to be your, your bump stop or your limit strap. You don't want that to be what limits your travel. You want a physical stop. In this case, it's metal on metal. Around something like this, you have a hydraulic bump stop and a limit strap, but they're basically doing the same thing, just protecting that shock from getting damaged. So now that we have all this done, we can pull everything back apart. Christian's gonna TIG weld these hooks onto the arms and then MIG weld all this stuff and we'll blend out just this outer surface to make it look nice. Yeah, we cap, I'll end up capping this hole off on the edge right here that you see. That'll get filled with weld and then we'll blend it flush. And then on the back side too, back in here, there's also a little hole, but I don't want any water or anything getting inside of there. So I'll just weld it all up. So that way nothing can get inside of there. Yeah, and one thing I also wanna mention, it's pretty obvious now, but when you're putting in that rod, you wanna put it into the, to the width of this plate. So you stuff it in until these ends are flush like they are now. So we should have mentioned that before, but just in case you're wondering, that's how you do it. So time to pull this apart and then Christian will get everything final welded. Bam! Bam! Christian got this all burned in, looking really good. I just need to take a flappy disc and flatten off this side. So it looks like this other one all blended in. So this beam is pretty much done besides that. So we're moving on to some other things. Christian got this burned in as well with TIG. And then right now we are doing these little gussets for the spindles. Part of the rules for the class 11 beams is that you can add a quarter inch gusset from the top of the spindle all the way up to the end of the steering arm. So that's what I've made here and got it all fitted nicely. Now Christian's gonna go ahead and get this all migged up. I hope you guys enjoyed that montage of the beam getting all wrapped up. I did want to do just a final walkthrough on it before it did go back on the car. One thing that I wanted to point out is that I've set these cam adjusters to be at maximum caster and zeroed out on the camber. So I'll put it on the car and if I see any camber, we can go ahead and adjust this. So this isn't completely tight yet, it's just snug and we'll be able to make adjustments from there. All this came out really good, blended and painted, looks perfect. Christian did a really good job welding all these seams and everything. This beam came out way better than our first one. I also just wanted to talk about the tie rods real quick. When you pull the sway bar off of the beam, don't just throw this away. You're gonna wanna cut it up and put it inside of these tie rods because these are hollow. 
So it'll essentially make this almost a solid tie rod, so it'll be a lot stronger than it currently is. But I did want to mention that little tip just for you guys who are only going to watch this video and try and build your beam to class 11 specifications. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and toss it back on the car and start working on that, and that will be episode three of this video. If you guys enjoyed this video of how to build this beam, please give it a like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.